Hey guys, this is Anya. This is the next video in our series on studying the Book of Jubilees together. We are studying the Book of Jubilees as a book of the Bible, no different from a book such as the Book of Genesis. And we, at least I, consider it as a divinely inspired text on, on the same level, if not greater than the books in the regular Bible. So that is the approach that we're taking when we're going through Jubilees, understanding it from that perspective. Because the fact is, ancient Jews, the, the Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, that is how they viewed the Book of Jubilees. They viewed it as a superior text to the Book of Genesis. So to properly understand how it was understood by the earliest users of the Book of Jubilees, it is important to adopt that mindset. Even if you don't believe it yourself, it's important to adopt that mindset to understand how it was understood by the by those who accepted it as scripture. And I have the same mindset as the ancient people in that in that respect. So I am one of the best equipped to present the Book of Jubilees in the way it was intended to be presented as a book of scripture, on par with, if not superior to the rest of the Bible. And so, with that said, I'm going to give you an overview of what this teaching series, this particular video is about. I start off with an overall general comparison of Jubilees and Genesis, and how there are actually are scribal errors and corruptions in the Book of Jubilees. However, it seems that overall, Jubilees is less corrupt and, and more reliable than, than Genesis. And so I, I touch upon that as well as I, I, I touch upon the different focus of each book because Genesis was written by the author of Genesis for a very specific purpose and Jubilees was written by the author for another very specific purpose. Those purposes partially overlap but they're also very different in their scope and that's what I go into. And, and I also discuss the amazing connections that Jubilees has with the Dead Sea Scrolls. First of all, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls support their Jubilees heavily. And then if you look at it from the other direction, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls is fragmentary. Jubilees is not. Jubilees is basically complete what we have. So we can take Jubilees and use it to give us amazing insight into the missing parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It can give us amazing understanding of portions of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Without Jubilees, we wouldn't be able to understand the Dead Sea Scrolls to as full of a potential. And then after this, we discuss the Law of Levi, which is one of the most amazing things we have found in the Book of Jubilees, preserved also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The connection is very much established and in, in the writings that we have, and it, it goes in great detail into an actual law that was given by Levi and that this law, we're told, was originated from the earlier patriarchs. So that, I discussed that and how there were so many laws of the priesthood that originated way before Moses, originated in the time of Levi, even, even earlier than Levi. And that includes laws of the, the animal sacrifices and things like that. And so I basically show the evidence using Jubilees as the primary uh, evidence along with the Dead Sea Scrolls to demonstrate how Levitical priesthood originated before Moses and that its laws are pre-Mosaic and therefore are not part of the Law of Moses. They do not originate in the Law of Moses, but they precede it and are therefore above the Law of Moses. So it's a very important revelation because it helps us refute a lot of false doctrines about the Law of Moses and about the Levitical priesthood. And we also talk about the high sanctity and importance of blood and what it means to honor the blood. I talk about that in that in this video and I also talk about the significance of Shavuot as observed by Abraham and the, the meaning and depth of, of Shavuot as a festival. And then I touch upon in good detail the separation from Gentiles. Jubilees as well as the Nazarene Acts as Jackson Snyder calls it, also known as recognitions of Clement and the homily, 
words of of uh, Clement. It is in those documents that the separation from Gentiles is explicitly commanded. Where if you are part of the covenant of Israel or the covenant of the church, you are not allowed to eat with Gentiles. It is a sin to eat with Gentiles. That's what these books teach. And I discuss that in greater detail in this video. And also I answer some objections brought up about how the New Testament appears to disagree with that concept, but I show how that's not actually the case. And finally, I, I end the video with the amazing teaching about Abraham's bosom. As you know, the New Testament talks about Abraham's bosom. I show overwhelming proof and evidence that the concept of Abraham's bosom as found in the Gospel of Luke only makes sense in light of the Book of Jubilees, and that the fact is that the Gospel of Luke is clearly alluding to the story in the Book of Jubilees. So that means that Jubilees is in authority to the New Testament. The New Testament is derived from the Book of Jubilees in that respect. And so if you accept the New Testament as authoritative, you have to accept Jubilees because it clearly is dependent on Jubilees as an authority. So that's pretty much the gist of this Bible study uh, video. And with that said, I just ask you guys to consider supporting this channel. Please share this, these videos with people. Share these uh, videos with your friends who are interested in the scriptures, especially who are open to more books of the canon, such as Book of Enoch. Definitely show this. If people like the Book of Jubilees, please share this video series with them. I think they will find it highly insightful. And people who just want to know about the Dead Sea Scrolls, these are key documents. Uh, key videos about about these documents so please if all you can do to support is share these videos then please share if you want to support in a more material way such as through personal activity of volunteering your time and energy your work and effort feel free to contact me if you want to donate some money feel free to contact me as well and we can talk about the best way to do that no matter what though, I am just glad that you support this channel in the way that you do and that you watch these videos. If you enjoy these videos, please like these videos and if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe because it's very important for the algorithm that you subscribe because the more that people subscribe, the more likely my videos are going to be seen by other people when they search for videos. So that is important. So, and it gives me moral support too, to see, wow, I have that many subscribers, that's amazing. And that many likes on this video, wow, that's cool. So definitely, you might think that your one subscription isn't meaningful, but it is to me. And your, your one like might not seem like much, but to me, it's meaningful. It gives me great satisfaction and boosts my commitment shows me to keep on doing what I'm doing and, and motivates me to be a better person when I see people liking the work that I'm doing. So anyways, de uh, definitely try to support in the way that you can, the way they f feel led to, and thank you guys so much for all the support you've, you've shown so far. It's been an amazing journey and I look forward to much more amazing things to come through my work and through the stuff I will be sharing on this channel going forward. Shalom to you guys, and God bless you all. Yeah. Sorry, guys, that we had missed last week, uh, but we're back, and we're pretty much intending on doing this every week, unless something comes up, and then we will let you guys know when the next one would be after. So... We ended last time right around the end of chapter 20 of Jubilees. And of course, there's 50 chapters of Jubilees. So we foresee that this whole series might take a while, but we're really trying to go in depth in working through the book of Jubilees together to see if there's any insights or 
new revelations that can be gleaned, especially in connection with the Dead Sea Scrolls or related literature, apocryphal literature. And so we're going to continue with that. Just load this one page. And can, you, can you give us an idea where we're at now? Yeah, so basically we're pretty much right near the end of Abraham's life. In fact, the where we're where we're starting off is the final year of of Abraham's life. And so up to this time, you know, we've gone through and discussed the the, the lives of the various patriarchs and and we've been focusing on Abraham the last couple times. And so we're going to wrap up Abraham's story today, and then we're going to start diving into Jacob's story. Because Isaac's story kind of gets skipped over. It's more, we have Abraham's story and Jacob's story. And Isaac is kind of like the, the middle ground where Isaac's story is covered in Abraham's story and Jacob's. But Isaac doesn't really have his own story. And there's not absolute proof, but as I mentioned in the other teaching we did, I think it was last week, Isaac doesn't seem to have ever written a book from his own perspective. Like there doesn't, there's a book of Abraham, which was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that Jubilees tells us the book of Abraham existed. So Dead Sea Scrolls corroborates what Jubilees says. But then Jubilees also tells us about a book of Jacob. But it doesn't tell us about a book of Isaac. So Isaac's story is just kind of skipped over pretty much, um, but the relevant information about Isaac is covered in Abraham's story and Jacob's story. So that's kind of where we are right at the end of Abraham's story and about to begin Jacob's story. So with that, I'll get started. And so as Genesis tells us, Abraham lived to 175 years old. And one thing we talked about the other time was how Abraham, after Sarah died, he married again one of his servants named Keturah, and he had a he had a family with her, many kids, and so it's just kind of crazy to think about that. Um, so he pretty much lived a full life, and just like Job, because in, in the book of Job, Job lost his kids, and then he had a whole new family and saw them to old age and, and saw his grandkids from that even new family. So Abraham w lived a, a full life of 175 years, pretty impressive for his time period. Now this, uh, I've mentioned this before as well, Jubilees, in general, overall, has a more accurate, more reliable chronology, I believe, versus Genesis. I think the manuscripts, the copies that we have of the book of Genesis are less reliable because the scribes were more bold to alter Genesis. The reason they were more bold to do it is because Genesis was such a major text that uh, was being used by everybody. So if it's being used by a lot of people and you want people to accept something, it makes sense to make a, a, some big changes if you want the group to believe your interpretation of history or a theology and whatnot. With something like Jubilees, there was very few people, relatively speaking, who accepted Jubilees as scripture, so there was less motivation to alter the text of Jubilees. Uh, the only errors we see in Jubilees, essentially, are scribal errors, scribal mistakes, where they make a incorrect um, mark. Like, for example, uh, in, in English, the number eight looks very similar to the number three. So if you're if you're reading a a a handwritten document, and you know if there's cursive and all kinds of things, 
very often letters and numbers could easily be confused. So that is what happened in some instances with the Book of Jubilees where some numbers were written down incorrectly by some of the scribes. So the scribes who were copying it got confused. And other, other times, the scribes felt there was contradictions, so they tried to fix the contradictions. So sometimes you'll see the scribes are trying to do math to try to fix this stuff. So that's kind of what's going on with the Book of Jubilees in the manuscripts we have, where some of the numbers don't add up. Some of the numbers contradict each other. But overall, there's a picture of the chronology so that you can easily tell which verses are in error and which are not. You can tell when you, it's like, it's like imagine if you have a puzzle piece, uh, a puzzle, let's say a thousand pieces, and, and you're trying to put the pieces together in the puzzle piece. Uh, well, if you have like three fourths of the puzzle completed, you have a pretty good idea of what the overall picture is. So if someone then hands you fake puzzle pieces that don't fit the overall picture, you can tell right away, okay, that obviously does not fit. So if that, if that's what we have with Jubilees. There's a clear, the errors in Jubilees are very easy to identify. Okay, that was a scribal error, that type of thing. Whereas with Genesis and some of the other books of the Old Testament, those errors are not as clear because the scribes were didn't just make mistakes. They also, they did make many mistakes, but the scribes also made intentional changes based on their interpretation or understanding of history and of, as I said, of theology. So that's why I, th I think Jubilees is so important for chronology purposes, because it self resolves a lot of disputes and uncertainties about the scriptural chronology and history. Um, but, uh, so in this verse, like, I'm using the R.H. Charles version, and I, I like to use the one on Summa Scriptura website. I don't know if any of you guys have used it, but that is a pretty good website. It has some apocryphal text on it. And it, it says, like, R.H. Charles has, like, brackets added to mark the dates for... Like, Jubilees tells us, like, uh, this event happened in this Jubilee, in this week of that Jubilee, in the year of that week. It has that chronology using Jubilees. That's why it's called Book of Jubilees. Because instead of saying the 2,000th year after creation, it tells you what Jubilee it is and what week of that Jubilee and what year of that week. So, so in this case, we see... the translator puts in brackets the dates to help people understand, oh, okay, this jubilee means this date. It's like a conversion table, essentially. And so in this verse, 20, chapter 21, verse 1, the conversion table, essentially, has it in brackets, 2057 AM. AM means the year of the world, which is basically the year since creation. Like 4,000 BC, 4004, according to... Uh, according that's, that's according to the Masoretic Text uh, Reckoning. Okay. Now, I was going to ask you about that anyway. Just how valid are those um, um, transformed dates? Do you consider them valid? Uh, the Jubilees dates? Yeah, that, they're, that are in the margin. Oh, the, well... Um, At least in, in, the, in, in the English translation, those dates are supplied by the translator entirely. Yeah. It's not in the Ethiopian text. Um, most of those dates are correct, but there are a few errors that Charles has made, which scholars have actually noted that he has made a few mistakes in the um, numbering system. However, mo as I said, most of the numbering is, is accurate, but some of the manuscripts differ of the numbers. And uh, like in this one, it says 2057 and in parentheses, 2050 question mark. And the reason 
is because some verses seem to indicate uh, seven years difference, seven years prior. So that's why R. Charles has the question mark because it's not clear uh, which date is intended. But when you do, I don't remember off the top of my head which date is correct, but when you do a thorough study of the chronology, you can easily discern which, uh, when it was that Abraham died. And actually, I, I should be able to, let me see. Um, I think it's the 2050 is the correct, and not 2057, but I would have to double check on that. So, anyways, we'll we'll continue with that from that, and we'll uh, move on. Um, okay, so we have something very interesting here. You know how. The Torah has all kinds of laws about sacrifice and various rituals. Well, what's interesting is, according to Jubilees, a lot of these laws originated prior to Moses. As we've discussed in other video videos, the holy days, the festival days, have originated with the various patriarchs, like the like Shavuot originated with Noah. And the seven days of unleavened bread originated with Abraham. The Feast of Tabernacles was a bit originated with Abraham. So there's all kinds of holy days that originated prior. Uh, so Jubilees is very good in, in kind of telling us the origin of the law. That's what the Jubilees is all about. Origin of law, origin of covenant. Whereas Genesis is more focused on the actual history, Jubilees is focused on the like Genesis is focused on the history of the people of Israel, whereas Jubilees is focused on the history of the law of Israel. So it goes and approaches it more from a legal perspective, covenant, uh, legal origination, things like that. Whereas Genesis is focusing on the people themselves and the relationships. So that is why certain things get skipped over, like the whole account of the giants and the sins of the watchers gets skipped over because it's not really relevant to the history of the people of Israel. It is very much relevant to the legal understanding of righteousness and holiness. And that is why Jubilees really focuses on it so much. And it also focuses on, on the books of scripture because Genesis, again, is just talking strictly about the history of the people. So it, it skips over the books, the, the, the holy texts, like it doesn't tell us, Genesis doesn't tell us about the Genesis Apocryphon, the Book of Enoch, or any of those books. It doesn't tell us those books existed because it's not a, it's not a document, Genesis is not a document intended for giving an overview of, of uh, like that type of, documentary type thing and the the legal nuance it's more as i said more of the actual people's history but jubilees focuses on that legal perspective so that's why we see the heavy uh discussion about the books of scripture that the various patriarchs wrote such as uh jubilees tells us that Enoch wrote a book, that Noah wrote a book, that Abraham and Jacob wrote a book, and, and that uh, the various, uh, like, uh, I believe it also mentions, it might mention Levi, I can't remember if it mentions, Jubilee mentions Levi or not, but so at any rate, it mentions a lot of writings, so it's very clear that Jubilees has that focus, and, and the reason, as we learned from the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Testament of Kohath, and Jubilees cor corroborates this, the scriptures was very much the prerogative of the priests, the priesthood. 
So the priests were actually given a law to preserve the scriptures and pass them on. So that is why Jubilees really focuses on that type of stuff. So with that said, what law is Jubilees here in chapter 21 speaking of, the origination of? And that law specifically is the one which says that you are to, in verse 10, it says, eat its meat on that day and on the second day, and let not the sun on the second day go down upon it till it is eaten, and let nothing be left over for the third day, for it is not acceptable, because it is not approved, and let it no longer be eaten. And all who eat thereof will bring sin upon themselves. For thus I have found it written in the books of my forefathers and in the words of Enoch and in the words of Noah. So here we see the original, there's actually, this law is in the book of Leviticus, which says do not, the sacrifice is to be considered an abomination on the third day, and nothing is to be eaten on the third day uh, after the sacrifice. So, this law from Leviticus is very ancient, according to Jubilees. It does not originate with Moses. It does not originate with the Levitical priesthood. It originates far prior. The, the, this law originated with Enoch, it says, and with Noah. So, but however, the book of Enoch does not have this law. So that means we're missing some of, the book, some of what Enoch said. Some of what Enoch said is gone. Evidence that there might have been other stuff Enoch wrote is, first of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we actually have in the Genesis of Apocryphon. We have fragments of a book of Enoch that was given to Lamech, and it's a completely different book than the book of Enoch that we know. It does correspond with the final chapters of the book of Enoch, and it tells the story of Lamech. And and uh, the, the, his son, Noah. And so that's one, that's one uh, key evidence that there's other stuff that Enoch wrote that's not in the Book of Enoch. We also see evidence in the Book of Giants that Enoch wrote other stuff, because in, in the fragments of the Book of Giants, we see fragments of a, another writing attributed to Enoch. And then finally, there's another document preserved by Christians from uh, Slavonic regions, and that is referred to by scholars as Second Enoch, also known as the Secrets of Enoch. This document, in many ways, is corrupt and unreliable when compared to First Enoch, or the Book of Enoch that everyone knows. But... Uh, I think it is legit in its original, and that and there are in Second Enoch there are passages which talk about sacrifices. So it's very plausible that the original version of Second Enoch had information basically in line with what Jubilees is saying Enoch wrote. So there is definitely indication and evidence that Enoch did write other stuff and. So if Jubilee says something uh, was written by Enoch and it's not in our copies of Enoch, there's reason to believe that Jubilee, what Jubilee says is true and that there was a writing in ancient times that had those words of Enoch in an actual document. And in support of that as well is the fact that the copies of the Book of Enoch themselves in the Dead Sea Scrolls they are in Aramaic, and in many instances, when you compare with the Ethiopian text that we have, the Aramaic text is very different. Typically, it's longer. It has extra words not found in our copies, especially the calendar section. You know, we were so focused on the calendar, um, and we're trying to follow the Enoch calendar. <clears throat> but many people have an erroneous system of the Enoch calendar because they assume Everything Enoch wanted us to know about the calendar is in the Book of Enoch. <clears throat> but it's simply not true because the original Book of Enoch, yes, had the full explanation of the calendar. But over time, the scribes 
condensed that material significantly, as we have found proven in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the longer version of Enoch found in fragments. And in that longer version had a much longer copy of the calendar section. So um, we got to be careful when, we're, when we try to be too dogmatic about our interpretation of the Enoch calendar if we try to justify it with, well, that's what Enoch says, so it has to be, because if, if, if uh, it wasn't the case, then Enoch would have said, we, Enoch would have told us. Like, for example, the intercalation of seven days. Many of us, I believe correctly, believe that a seven-day week is to be added every few years, every several years. This, this is not explicitly mentioned by Enoch in our copies. So some people would argue, because Enoch never told us that in our copies, that means it can't be true. But as the Dead Sea Scrolls proves, just because it's not in our copies doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't in the original text of the Book of Enoch. So now we can't just say, if it has to be in the Book of Enoch in our copies. Now we have to see, okay, let's try to understand what Enoch is saying and use logic to what he's saying. If we apply logic to what he says, we can fill in the holes of scripture. There are holes in the book of Enoch. So by reading what our copies of Enoch say, we can look at the, we can see, okay, here's the principle that Enoch is telling us. Let's take this principle and apply it and try to fill in the holes, the gaps that the scribes left us in the book of Enoch. So if we do that, I think we can have a high degree of confidence of a proper calendar system. Um, so that is one of the amazing things uh, in this chapter of the origin of law, specifically connecting it, uh, the law of Leviticus to uh, Enochian times. But then it goes even far farther and is a very powerful section I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to specify the importance and significance of this. So it says, chapter 21, verses 11 to 18. And on, and on all thy oblations thou shalt strew salt. And let not the salt of the covenant be lacking in all thy oblations before the Lord. And as regards the wood of the sacrifices, beware lest thou bring wood for the altar in addition to these. Cypress, bay, almond, fir, pine, cedar, savin, fig, olive, myrrh, laurel, and espalathus. And of these kinds of wood lay upon the altar under the sacrifice, such as have been tested as to their appearance. And do not lay any split or dark wood, but hard and clean, without fault, a sound and new growth. And do not lay old wood, for its fragrance is gone, because there is no lo longer fragrance in it as before. Besides these kinds of wood, there is none other that thou shalt place, for the fragrance is dispersed, and the smell of its fragrance goes not up to heaven. Observe this commandment and do it, my son, that thou shalt be upright in all thy deeds. And at all times be clean in thy body, and wash thyself with water before thou approachest to offer on the altar. And wash thy hands and thy feet before thou drawest near to the altar. And when thou art done sacrificing, wash again thy hands and thy feet. And let no blood appear upon you, nor upon your clothes. Be on thy guard, my son, against blood. Be on thy guard exceedingly. Cover it with dust." And do not eat any blood, for it is the soul. Eat no blood, whatever. So that's from Jubilees. And there's two documents I'm going to read in connection with what I just read from Jubilees. So the first is the Testament of Levi from the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs in the Greek manuscripts. And so, let's see here. <clears throat> Okay, so it says, 
in chapter 9 of the Testament of Levi. And after two days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this for a second. Okay. Um, okay, verse 6 of chapter 9 of Testament of Levi. And Isaac called me continually to put me in remembrance of the law of the Lord, even as the angel of the Lord showed unto me. And he taught me the law of the priesthood, of sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, first fruits, free will offerings, peace offerings. And each day he was instructing me and was busied on my behalf before the Lord and said to me, Beware of the spirit of fornication, for this, uh, for this shall continue and shall by thy seed pollute the holy place. Take therefore to thyself a wife without blemish or pollution, while yet thou art young, and not of the race of strange nations. And before entering into thy holy place, bathe. And when thou offerest the sacrifice, wash. And again, when thou finishest the sacrifice, wash. Of twelve trees having leaves, offer to the Lord, as Abraham taught me also. And of every clean beast and bird, offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And of all thy first fruits and of wine, offer the first as a sacrifice to the Lord God. And every sacrifice thou shalt salt with salt. Okay, so we stop there. So there's some amazing agreements between this two, these two. It can't be coincidence. That means either the Testament of Levi um, got its information from Jubilees, or Jubilees got it from Testament of Levi, or they both got it from a common source. So uh, some of the similarities are that the 12 trees, both mentioned only 12 trees can be used, and then both emphasize that you have to wash after everything. The priest has to wash after doing every step. And then also um, it specifically states that uh, in Jubilees, Abraham is teaching this to Isaac. It says... Um, in, in chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Abraham called Isaac his son and commanded him. And so what I read from Jubilees, starting in verse 11, about the priestly stuff, the salt and the, and the trees and the washing, all that is specifically from Abraham commanding to, to Isaac. And the Testament of Levi said as these laws were as Abraham taught me also. And both Jubilees and the Testament of Levi emphasize that you are to salt, to salt the sacrifices. So some striking correspondences there. And not only this, as I said, there's two documents. The other document is called Aramaic Levi document. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long. But it actually is an Aramaic version of the Testament of Levi, but a much older, more archaic, more authoritative version. Basically, the evidence indicates to us that the Testament of Levi was originally written in Hebrew, slash Aramaic, and that the scribes later made a much shorter version, and it was probably created by the, by the Christian scribes. So Christians probably took the text of the Testaments of the 12 Patriarchs and shortened it significantly and condensed it to a, the basic gist of the story because it was a very long document, longer than the book of Genesis and Exodus. I think it's longer than both of them combined. That's how long it was, the original text of the Testaments of the 12 Patriarchs. So scribes were not as willing to copy a huge text like that if no one was going to use it, or very few people were going to use it. So, because they didn't want the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs to disappear entirely, the scribes decided, okay, you know what? We're going to create a summary of this, because if this text becomes lost, we want people to at least know the basic gist of the story and the information. So they took the full major long stuff and they shortened it to give us the Reader's Digest version of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. And we are very fortunate for that because without it, we would be at a loss for a lot of information. Now, because they did that, they sometimes added their interpretation, especially in passages of, of Messianic prophecy. So sometimes 
there are certain prophecies that seem a little bit too Christian to be authentic. It's pro those prophecies are probably based on real prophecies in the original Hebrew Jewish text, but the prophecies were probably less ambiguous and not as clearly messianic uh, and not as clearly Christian. But in later times, the scribes uh, interpreted those prophecies as Christian, pointing to, to Yeshua, and so they they changed the text to make it more explicitly Christian. And that was an interpretation. They didn't just add a random prophecy, but they took what a pro the prophecy that was already there and added their spin on it, their understanding. Sometimes I think they were pretty faithful to the prophecy, but other times they may have twisted it a little bit unintentionally. But So that's kind of the uh, extent of what happened with the Testaments. So we are fortunate to have found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as Cairo Geniza, fragments of the original version of the Testament of Levi, as well as fragments of the original version of the Testament of Naphtali. So in this fuller version of the Testament of Levi, this same passage that Jubilees talks about is found in great detail. So I'm going to read some of that stuff. I have a PDF file, so I'm just going to pull it up. Okay. It's extremely lengthy, so I'm going to skip. The parts I'm going to skip are the sacrifices, because it gives like extremely detailed stuff about the sacrifices. Um, Like, like, you know, so how Jubilee said, it said, let's see, where was it? Um, no, it was the test, it was the uh, Testament of Levi, which said it, and it says in the Testament of Levi, he taught me the law of the priesthood of sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, first fruits, free will offerings, peace offerings. So he was he basically taught him how to do the sacrifices. And that's what we see. We see in this longer version of the Testament of Levi a full in-depth uh, command of how to do the sacrifices. And the implications of this are very important because a lot of people argue that the Levitical priesthood did not exist before the Golden Calf incident. That's what um, some people like Nolan, uh, who, who teach that Melchizedek priesthood thing, uh, that's what some of these people are teaching, that these laws did not originate, the Levitical priesthood did not originate until after Moses. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jubilees, uh, the Testaments of the Patriarchs paint a very different picture. They teach that no, the Levitical priesthood was in existence and was very much active and was limited, restricted only to the line of Levi. So originally, Abraham was a priest. Isaac was a priest. And then Isaac taught Levi the, pre the laws of the priesthood uh, of how to be a priest and at that point, when Levi was chosen, he was made high priest, and the Levitical priesthood was created with Levi, according to these documents, Jubilees, and the Testaments of the Patriarchs. So, um, hold on one second, okay? So, um, Levitical priesthood originated, uh, as I said, with, with Levi himself. And Levi actually was the first high priest of the, of the Levitical priesthood. And then his son, uh, Kohath, was the next high priest. And then his son, Amram, was the next high priest. And finally, Aaron was. was so, Aaron was not the first Levitical high priest. 
So uh, that that refutes a lot of false doctrines that people are, are teaching against the law. A lot of people have false teachings against the law of Moses, and some people teach that the animal sacrifices, um, they teach some false things about the animal sacrifices, in my view. They, they say that the animal sacrifices, none of those uh, things were uh, commanded until after the golden calf incident. But what we see in Jubilees and the Testaments of the Patriarchs is that some of the sacrifices were commanded, or at least they were allowed. There, the, the way the Testament of Levi in the longer version reads, it doesn't say you must command, I mean, you must do these sacrifices. Instead, the way it presents it is when you do these sacrifices, do it this way. So it doesn't tell us when the sacrifices are to be done, but it just tells us this is how these sacrifices are to be done. And so, it's just, it's very clear once we see these other writings that there's a, you have to make a choice. Do you go with these writings or do you, do you go with the false narrative that is being taught about uh, against the, the, the law and, and against the, the Levitical priesthood? Because there is evidence, I'm very much convinced of this, that the Levitical priesthood is not um, obsolete. It is not done away with. Some people might appeal to Hebrews to argue that it's, it's gone. But we have the testimony of Enoch. Enoch tells us that the, the temple, there's going to be a third temple, and it is going to be a temple of Elohim, a righteous temple that Enoch and Elijah are going to endorse. And this is going to be, we are told in the book of Enoch, this will happen before the judgment takes place. This is in chapter 90 of the book of Enoch, I believe. And in the dream vision. So, we also have the book of Jeremiah, which tells us that the, as long as there are sun and moon, the Levitical priesthood will not be uh, annulled. The covenant with Levi will remain forever, as long as the sun and the moon and the heavens are there. Which, and that's interesting because that's the same type of language the Messiah uses when he speaks of the law not being abolished. He has not come to abolish the law. As long as, un, as long as the heavens are here, the law shall not be abolished, he, uh, it says in, in the Gospel of Matthew. So when we read overall the Book of Jubilees, we see a very different story where the Levitical priesthood is very much in full force with Levi himself. Uh, so that, to me, is very powerful and you can learn a lot of truth from this understanding and revelation of the Levitical priesthood. So with that said, I'm going to read parts of this uh, Testament of Levi in the longer version for the sacrifice stuff. Not the sacrifice, but for the priest stuff. Okay. And we went from Bethel and we camped at the fortress of Abraham, our father, with, uh, with Isaac, our father. And Isaac, our father, saw all of us and he blessed us and he rejoiced. And when he knew that I was a priest of God Most High, Lord of Heaven, he began to instruct me and teach me the law of the priesthood. And he said to me, Levi, guard yourself, my son, my son, from all impurity and from all sin. Your law is greater than all flesh. And now, my son, I will show you the true law, and I will not conceal any matter from you to teach you the law of the priesthood. First, guard yourself, my son, from all wantonness and impurity, and from all sexual immorality. And as for you, take for yourself a wife from my clan, and do not desecrate your seed with prostitutes. Behold, you are a holy seed, and your seed is holy, just like the holy place, since you are called a holy priest for all the seed of Abraham. You are near to God and near to all his holy ones. Now be worthy in your flesh from all impurity of every man. And when you stand to enter the house of God, bathe in water and then put on the priestly vestment. And when you are clothed, wash your hands and your feet once again before you approach the altar at all. 
And when you take to offer all that is proper to take to the altar, wash your hands and your feet once again and make the offering. Splitting logs and examining and examine them for uh, and examine them for worms first for worms and then lift them up. For like so did I see Abraham, my father, taking pains. From all twelve kinds of wood, he said to me that it is proper to take of them to the altar, the scent of whose smoke rises sweetly. And these are their names, cedar, juniper, almond, fir, acacia, pine, cypress, fig, and oleaster, laurel, myrtle, and asphalethos. These are the ones that he said to me it is fitting to lift up of them beneath the holocaust on the altar. And when you lift up any of these woods onto the altar, and the fire begins to kindle them, behold, then you shall begin to sprinkle the blood on the sides of the altar. And again, wash your hands and your feet of the blood and begin to lift up the salted limbs. And uh, so it, it keeps going and, and gives details of uh, the sacrifices. Um, and then it says, And if everything that you do, do it in order, do it by measure and by weight. You shall not add anything that is not proper, and you shall not leave out of reckoning what is proper, of the wood proper for offering for all that ascends the altar. And then it gives how much wood for each animal that you sacrifice, uh, how much is proper. So there's very clear and strict laws of the priesthood and, and animal sacrifices prior to the golden calf. So if the Testament of Levi and Jubilees are legit and authentic writings, according to them, those animal, sac the animal sacrifices have very necessary laws for holiness. Uh, if you are going to do an animal sacrifice to the creator, you have to do it the proper way for it to be considered holy. And there is a, a strict way for it to be holy. That's what we see in, in these writings. So then it, it continues a little bit later and says, And every hour wash hands and feet when you go to the altar. And when you go out of the sanctuary, do not let any of the blood touch your robe. Do not lay hold of it on the same day. And wash hands and feet completely of all flesh. And let there not be seen on you any blood or any life, for the blood is life in the flesh. And if in the house you eat some meat for yourself, cover its blood with earth first before you eat any of the meat, and do not any longer be eating in proximity to the blood. For thus did my father Abraham command me, because he found it so in the writing of the book of Noah concerning the blood. And now as to you, beloved child, I say you are beloved to your father and a holy one of the Lord Most High, and you shall be beloved over all your brothers. By your seed shall one be blessed on the earth, and your seed shall be preserved for all the ages in the book of remembrance of life. And your name and the name of your seed shall not be erased for the ages. And now, child, Levi, bless Are we hung up? I think so. Hey, I'm back. Uh, okay. Where did I? Where did I? Um, where did my audio cut out? Uh, about two minutes ago, you were quoting something about a child and a blessing. Okay, let's see. Um, so where it said. Uh, did, did you hear me mention the Book of Remembrance of Life? Yes. Uh, okay, so, so I'll just read that sentence again. Um, By your seed shall one be blessed on the earth, and your seed shall be preserved for all the ages in the Book of Remembrance of Life. And your name and the name of your seed shall not be erased for the ages. 
And now, child Levi, blessed shall your seed be on earth for the generations of the ages. So what I had said was, it mentions the book of remembrance of life, and, and that, that sounds like the book of life that you see in, in Revelation. And so we wonder when we see stuff like this in the New Testament, where did it come from? Well, this is evidence that like some of these concepts originated in Dead Sea Scrolls type of literature, because we find it here in the Testaments of uh, the Testament of Levi here. And when it said, when Levi in this Testament of Levi said, he thus did my father Abraham command me because he found it so in the writing of the book of Noah concerning the blood. Well, Jubilees tells us in this same section, uh, chapter 21, he had said, for, this is Abraham talking to Isaac. It's quoting, Abraham is saying, for thus I have found it written in the books of my forefathers and in the words of Enoch and in the words of Noah. So Jubilees has Abraham telling his son Isaac, that the laws of the priesthood he found written in the in the book of Enoch and, the, and in the book of Noah. And then in the Testament of Levi, the longer version, it has us telling us that Abraham told Isaac that he found it in the writing of the book of Noah. So this is an amazing correspondence, and there it can't be coincidence. Again, this is too striking a uh, correspondence. So Jubilees, since it claims to take so much of its information from earlier documents, it makes more sense to believe that Jubilees got this information from the Testament of Levi, the original version, the longer version of the Testament of Levi. So this is a concept like, you know, the, the law speaks of two or three witnesses. And here we're seeing the two witnesses, Jubilees and the Testament of Levi, they are confirming each other. And so uh, th this, we didn't know about this prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls. But once the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, we, we discovered that Jubilees has so many striking correspondences with the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, un it's unbelievable how many agreements there are. I've touched upon this before, but it also has some amazing agreements with the Testament of, An of Amram. Amram was the father of Moses and Aaron. And there's some stuff in the Testament of Amram, which is found nowhere else except in the Book of Jubilees. And again, we've talked about how the Genesis Apocrypha found in the Dead Sea Scrolls has agreements with the Book of Jubilees found nowhere else. No other document has this information, but Jubilees and Genesis Apocrypha have the same information. So in many ways, Jubilees is a key to restoring the Dead Sea Scrolls and it's a window into a lost a lost uh, world. Jubilees is a testimony to what was once in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It, it's a link, a gateway to the Dead Sea Scrolls in many ways. So I think to understand the Dead Sea Scrolls it's absolutely essential to understand the Book of Jubilees because Jubilees is like the foundation text of the Dead Sea Scrolls or at least one of the main ones. In fact, Jubilees is quoted in the Essene writing known as Damascus document. Ju the book of Jubilees is actually quoted in it. And it's law, the, the information in Jubilees is relied upon heavily in, in many other Dead Sea Scroll documents. So, um, or Jubilees relies on other documents. As, as I said, the relationship is one way or the other. And Basically, any documents that claim to be written by a patriarch are probably the source of Jubilees. Um, any writing in the Dead Sea Scrolls that is claiming to be written by a patriarch was probably the source of Jubilees rather than derived from Jubilees. Um, so that's the extent of the Testaments that I'll read for today. Um, so that is... For me, that is one of the most amazing connections that I've found so far. So, one thing to emphasize is the insistence that, hold on one sec.
the insistence that uh, the the priests wash their bodies when they uh, do the when they're dealing with blood, and that it's it's a very very um, strong view against blood. Where basically, don't let blood appear on your clothes. Don't let uh, blood be around you. Cover it with dust. We we do see the command in the law to cover the blood, uh, to cover the blood with dust, but we don't really fully see in the scripture how bad blood is considered to be around you, and it's considered very polluting in in these Dead Sea Scroll documents. So if we want to apply this to our lives, I think it's important that we treat animals with respect and. We don't, um, like, for example, you don't want to bathe in the blood of, of animals. That's disgusting. That's an abomination. You don't want to profane and disrespect the blood of animals. So if you are to eat animals for food, treat, treat the flesh with dignity. Um, bury bury the blood cover it it's a way of honoring the life because life is in the blood and so we are not to have complete disregard for the value of what the other life that has been given for for our benefit so that it's very important and i think to, I, I don't think that our culture really has a that value of appreciation of the life of animals. There are people who do appreciate animals and, you know, to some extent, very much so to the point of believing we should not eat animals at all, which is a very uh, noble enterprise to do. If you, if you do not want to eat animals, that's a very noble thing. And I think you will be blessed and rewarded, rewarded for that, uh, for that sacrifice. And, but too, too many people don't have that kindness towards animals. Too many people take animals for granted and abuse them. And, you know, the Yihad is talking about ameliorating the earth and, and uh, redeeming creation. And how are we going to do that if we're abusing it and treating it horribly? So the best way, we're, all, we're limited people. We don't have much power by ourselves. We do know, according to Yeshua, we're to be gathered in his name. Great things can be done. So we could accomplish great things if we c come together in righteousness. But so few people are righteous that we many times don't have anyone to be, to be, our, to be our second person. And we might not be righteous enough ourselves. So... The best thing we can do prior to finding a group of people that agree with us is simply taking responsibility for your own life, for your own actions, for your own behavior. So respecting creation and everything you do, not polluting the earth to the best of your ability. Unfortunately, the world we live in, we pretty much are going to pollute the earth inevitably because we're stuck in a system. But we can do our part to reduce the impact we have and we can try to respect life whatever we do in our lives so this emphasis is very important and jubilees kind of indicates to us that it's not just about humans but creation as well uh, the rest of creation is very much important thank you that was really good i like that yeah you're welcome let me see there's Okay, Jackson has left the building. He'll be back in a minute. Give him a minute. All right. Um, let's see what we've got here. You, um, yeah, do you have anyone have questions so far? Do you have any links to any of those um, works that you were talking about during your teaching that are accessible? for free or anything like you usually do or no um you talking about the aramaic levi document i was reading from 
Yeah, that'd be cool. So there is this one website I use. Um, it, it's not necessarily like the like safest website to use, only in the sense that it's it's not recommended because some people could get it's it's potentially it has a potential for some people to um, I don't know if viruses or something, but basically if you if you download files from an unknown source, there's a there's a risk. Right. What, um, if, you have, what if you have pretty good um, antivirus software? I mean, I don't. I haven't noticed any problems myself, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened to my yeah. okay. to my computer. But um, yeah. I'll I'll just post this one. Sweet. This is the uh, this has the testimonial Levi that I was reading from. Nice. Um, I'll put it in the, the chat the chat box. This is this is one of the greatest assets besides your teachings are your references. You know. And then, you're just awesome. Thank I you. believe in free sharing of the scriptures and in the resources because, like, uh, I've talked about this before, but copyright, I, I believe, was invented. It had a good reason that they tried to invent it, but it's very much contrived, and I don't believe it's authentic. So... I think it was good, well intended because they were trying to um, help the authors prevent them from losing money. Well, but yeah. in the All process, right. they have taken away our rights and they have extremely limited what we can do. Like, I don't know if you guys knew this, but for example, um, they actually copyrighted the Happy Birthday song. And until recently, like uh, maybe a decade ago or something, you were, or a couple decades ago, you were not allowed to publicly sing Happy Birthday unless you had permission from the copyright holders. You, you, you could sing it like in a private thing, but you couldn't like, you couldn't uh, do a performance. Right. And sing there's, it. A, there's a lot of copyright right on music. Uh, being a former musician yeah you run into that all the time you have to be very careful about how you do that but yeah, and so that's you know i get that but this kind of literature should be out for i agree with you should be out there for people to be able to read you know yeah i i, I think that th there's a risk when, when when you when you share some of this stuff there's a risk but it's a low risk because they typically are not they're not looking to like get everyone in trouble they're looking for the main people who like they're they're much more likely to pursue legal action to people who are trying to make money off others that's what what, what you have to have big problems with right if it's people not are selling the scriptures yeah violating copyright to do that they're they're taking someone else's work and trying to make money off of it they shouldn't be making off they shouldn't be ripping people off uh, for money anyway. You know, like, um, I don't have a problem necessarily with people charging money for uh, for what they've written, even if it's like the scriptures, but within reason. Um, and you don't want to say, oh, you don't have money, then I'm not going to give you a copy of the scriptures. That's not right. Uh, but I think if it's a commentary or a translation, a fresh translation, of something that's already in the uh, public domain, yes, you have, you know, that's your work, and you should be able to copyright your work. But if it's something that's um, been in the public domain, you shouldn't be able to lock it back up. And I think a lot of the stuff, like, probably has. I'm not sure about this document, because that's pretty specific. But like you say, we're not trying to sell it. We're just trying to learn from it. Well, so for example, there are certain places where it's forbidden to to uh, to have Bibles uh, in in that area. Oh yeah. So do you do you break the law and, and give people Bibles even though it's illegal, or do you say, okay, well that's the law, 
and I don't think we I don't think uh, we are required to follow that law. When the law when the law violates our rights, we do not have to submit to that law. So well, if I was going to do that, I would do it um, quietly, and I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, exactly. yes, I would give it as the need arose myself. Yes, I agree Jackson, with you. Jackson, you're back. You're muted. It was a LASIK break. Oh, what's that? That means you have to go pee. Ah, yes. Great. Good to know. So you, uh, did you do it according to the holiness that the book of Deuteronomy commands? Did you, uh, did you take your little shovel thing? Well, one of the questions now uh, is that whether you do it standing up or sitting down. Not, not whether you go and bury it someplace. It's whether a man should stand up or sit down. And if a man sits down, is there something wrong with that? Yes. And, yes, if, and if you should leave the toilet seat up or not. That, that is another uh, Especially when there's a woman in the house. Yes. You don't leave that toilet seat up or you know you're in trouble. Yes. I do. You oh. just don't understand. You know, if you, if you don't know it's up and you go to sit down and you end up in the toilet, that in the middle of the night. Oh, that's not good. No. All right. So let's see here. Um, going back to Jubilees. I'm trying to see where we can stop here. What? Uh, what? What did we stop on so I can uh, make a note, please? Thank you. Um, so w w I'm going to go. We are pretty much at the end of chapter 21, and I'm going to quickly go through chapter 22 uh, because that ends with Abraham's. Uh, that ends with the, the death of Abraham. And I kind of, I kind of want to finish Abraham's story so we can move on to the Jacob story next time. So I, I'm going to quickly uh, go to that. So, okay. It says in chapter 22, verse 1, that in the second year, that is the year in which Abraham died. That it came to pass in that year, uh, the year in which Abraham died, that Isaac and Ishmael came from the well of the oath to celebrate the feast of weeks. That is the feast of the first fruits of the harvest to Abraham. Um, they came to Abraham, their father, and Abraham rejoiced because his two sons had come. For Isaac had many possessions. Um, sorry, I'm gonna. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip that because um, I don't need to read everything. I'm just kind of trying to give the overview here. So what's interesting about that is it tells us that they kept the Shavuot, and not just Isaac, but Ishmael too. Ishmael actually kept the holy days and was keeping the law. He was commanded by Abraham to do that, and Ishmael obeyed because he was still part of the family of Abraham. But after a few generations, Ishmael's descendants stopped keeping it because they were no longer part of Abraham's family anymore. But we see that this is just a very ancient thing. And we see the, the Shavuot actually is a word in Hebrew that means weeks, but also oaths. So it's the well of the oath to celebrate the feast of oaths or feast of weeks and okay can you elaborate on that just a tiny bit about the oaths that yeah, were involved? so um shavuot originated with noah and it was made by a covenant and an oath by elohim to not flood the earth again. So it, it's like a double meaning. It has the meaning of the oath and the meaning of weeks. 
then it's like a play on words here because they came to the well of the oath to celebrate the Feast of Oaths or the Feast of Weeks. Um, I be, I'm going to double check that right now just to make sure. But uh, that's right. One second. Um, yes. Yeah, so, beer. They call it called beer shiba or beer shiva. Um, Okay, so Beersheba, the Sheba part, is spelled with a Shin Bet Ayan, a Shin Bet Ayan, and Shavuot is spelled Shin Bet Wa Ayan Wa Tav. And that's a plural, the, the, the Wa Tav at the end is a plural. But it's the same root word, Shiba, or however you want to pronounce it, Shibaot. Um, so it means oath, but it can also mean weak, depending on context. So it's this double meaning that we see in Jubilees. At any rate, it is evidence of further evidence of the feast of Shavuot being observed prior to Moses. So it, it does not originate with the law of Moses, as many people think. That's significant. It is, yes, because, because if people argue that the law of Moses was done away with, well, that's not part of the law. Just like just like if people say the law was, was done away with, they still believe that murder is wrong, right? They still believe adultery is wrong. They still believe stealing is wrong. But they say they say the laws that were unique to the law of Moses, those are done away with. But if those laws preceded the law of Moses, then how can it be that the law being done away with suddenly makes those laws not valid? Because they're not even, they don't, they didn't originate from the law of Moses. So if the law of Moses was done away with, that doesn't mean anything about all these pre-Moses laws. So that's important information to realize that the argument that people make against the law doesn't have a lot of compelling force once we realize that most of the law originated prior to Moses. Also, um, in Qumran, Shavuot was, a, was their primary uh, festival, their most important one. So to know that that goes back to Noach is awesome. Yeah, they, orig they, uh, they entered the covenant like when when people became Essenes, they had the they they had them become full members on Shavuot. That was their day of becoming a, a full member of their community, because they on that day they renewed the covenant that was made with Noah, and that was considered the most important covenant of all, the covenant of blood, not to eat blood and to respect the blood and to keep the holy days. It was very much the, the foundational festival, as you pointed out. Do you have any more details on that particular festival other than that? Um, just stuff found in Jubilees, and there's some stuff in the Dead Sea Gold, but nothing nothing too much. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... Well, okay. uh, Most of it's... We're going to work on train. that at, uh, at Shavuot. That's most, of this, most of the extra stuff in the Dead Sea Gold is sacrificial stuff that we can't do anyway. So, um, like animal sacrifices and whatnot. So, now we see a Abraham uh, gives Jacob a blessing, and then for some reason he says, Exercise authority over all the seed of Seth. I don't know why that is used. That could be a mistranslation because Seth, it doesn't make sense. Seth is from, you know, Adam's son, Seth. Why would he say Seth? The word Seth in Hebrew actually has a di has other meaning. Like the, na the names in Hebrew, names have 
additional meaning. And so the, the name Seth here, I think, is a mistranslation. It's probably something deeper. Uh, not the seed of Seth, the seed of, of um, establishment or something. I'd have to do a translation to really see. But uh, yeah. And that's in verse 12, which, which speaks of the seed of Seth. And he says in verse 13, May the Most High God give thee all the blessings wherewith he has blessed me and wherewith he blessed Noah and Adam. May the rest of the, may they rest on the sacred head of thy seed from generation to generation forever. So the, the blessing for Noah and Adam was very specific and it indicates to us that Adam was not this horrible person. You know, he... He sinned, but he was he was given an opportunity to redeem himself through repentance, and he received blessings for that. Okay, so so now we see verse sixteen. Do thou, my son Jacob, remember my words and observe the commandments of Abraham, thy father. Separate thyself from the nations, and eat not with them, and do not according to their works, and become not their associates, for their works are unclean, and all their ways are a pollution and an abomination and uncleanness. So important there, it says, separate thyself from the nations, and eat not with them, and become not their associate, because their works are unclean, their ways are a pollution and an abomination of uncleanness. So what, what does this mean? Well, the Nazarene Acts actually says something very similar. It says if you're not, if you're baptized, you are not supposed to eat with someone who is unbaptized. And we see the New Testament speak of, of, uh, of some of the Jews not eating with Gentiles, and then, and then Peter said it, it is permitted to eat with Gentiles who are of righteousness, and. Uh, but this is very much, so where do these ideas come from? It's very clear they originated like from Jubilees, which, which, has a, which demonstrates that we're not supposed to be eating, if we are of the covenant, we're not supposed to be eating with those who are not of covenant. If you're, if you're not in covenant, then it's okay to eat with people not of covenant because you don't have to be holy in that same way. But when you're part of the covenant people, you have to be holy. So for example, if you're a baby, or if you're a young child, let's let's say you are a child to Gentiles. Well, you can eat with your parents because you are not sanctified, and it's okay. It's not a fair, and it's it's not a fair burden to place on children who are not part of covenant that they can't eat with their family or friends. Uh, it's fair when they've grown up in the covenant and they know from birth that it's that they're not allowed or if they have joined the covenant as an adult once they be once they decide to become holy they are to separate themselves from those who are not holy and this is an extra burden extra requirement on on those who want to be part of the covenant it's not a requirement for those outside of the covenant and this is something i've struggled with because i have not i have decided to not yet join the covenant because i want to be very sure, and I want to purify myself. Um, there was a time years ago where I wasn't eating with anybody. I'm sure some of you guys remember that when I went to some of the of the events, the hot events. I was eating by myself and, and not really d doing stuff with people. I've lightened up on that, and that's mainly because I've realized that I'm not holy and I'm not part of the covenant as of yet. So I believe eventually, if I'm going to join the covenant, I have to separate myself from those who are not. And that's very tough. It's very challenging because you ha if you are to live this out, you have to be very holy and not everybody is cut out for that. And it's a very challenging thing, but it's something that the scrolls are very emphatic on, holiness. And so if people are, I, I will say this, if people are not yet willing to, to take that leap of holiness, 
there are degrees of holiness. If you're not fully in covenant, or if you're if you are in covenant but you're not strong enough to 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 separate yourself, there there, there are degrees of what you can do to purify yourself and keep yourself as holy as possible. And so, just consider everything you're doing and. The Dead Sea Schools teaches a principle of, of cleanness and holiness. So if if you aren't fully willing to, to follow everything as of yet, you could still implement a lot of the principles in your life of being clean and you know, healthy and trying to avoid uh, sinful stuff and, and avoiding activities which have a lot of uncleanness. So like, you know, don't go to don't go to strip clubs, for example. You know, don't don't uh, don't go to places that there's a lot of sin likely to be. You know, you might not want to go to a beach because at beaches there's a lot of sin there. Sometimes you know, it all depends on how how far you want to go in holiness. Um, it's definitely worthwhile trying to consider all your actions because we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the New Testament the path to salvation is narrow and as the new testament says broad is the way to destruction few be able to find it so there is a risk of being too overly strict but there's also be a risk of being too um under cautious not being cautious enough so it's something we all struggle with and we all have to figure out what's required of us and how holy do i need to be and these are questions we're forced to ask when we're studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see, okay, these people were, were holy. I want to emulate them. How holy do I need to be to be acceptable? And, and that's something that we all should really try to work on, I think. Um, and, okay, the final thing that I'm going to mention is... When Jacob dies in this chapter, it's just amazing because this is, I am absolutely certain without a shadow of a doubt, this is the origin of what's in the New Testament. So it says in verse uh, 22, it says, They shall descend into, the, into Sheol. And then it says, um, so it's talking about Sheol. Abraham's talking about Sheol. And then right after he's talking about Sheol, it says, He sees commanding him and blessing him. And the two lay together on one bed. And Jacob slept in the bosom of Abraham, his father's father. And he kissed him seven times. And his affection and his heart rejoiced over him. And he blessed him with all his heart and said, The Most High God, the God of all and Creator of all, who brought me forth from Ur of the Chaldees, that he might give me this land to inherit it forever, and that I might establish a holy seed, blessed be the Most High forever. And he blessed Jacob and said, My son over whom with all my heart and my affection I rejoice, may thy grace and thy mercy be lifted up upon him and upon his seed always. And do not forsake him, nor set him at naught from henceforth unto the days of eternity, and may thine eyes be opened upon him and upon his seed, that thou mayest preserve him and bless him, and mayest sanctify him as a nation for thine inheritance. And bless him with all thy blessings from henceforth until all the days of eternity. And renew thy covenant and thy grace with him and with his seed according to all thy good pleasure unto all the generations of the earth. It says, And he placed two fingers of Jacob on his eyes, and he blessed the God of gods, and he covered his own face and stretched out his feet and slept the sleep of eternity and was gathered to his fathers. And notwithstanding all this, Jacob was lying in his bosom, and knew not that Abraham his father's father was dead. And Jacob awoke from his sleep, and behold, Abraham was cold as ice, and he said, Father, Father, but there was none that spake, and he knew that he was dead. So the New Testament speaks of the bosom of Abraham. Very strangely, it says that Lazarus went into the bosom of Abraham. And it's confusing. Why does it say this? There's no real rhyme or reason why. Well, now we know why. Jubilees tells us why. The bosom of Abraham represents the story of Jacob lying in Abraham's bosom. Abraham was dead. Jacob was in 
Abraham's bosom with Abraham dead. So Lazarus similarly went to Abraham's bosom. Abraham was dead and Lazarus went to, to his bosom. And that represents peace, safety, comfort, and acceptance. And it's specifically for the people of Israel. Jacob. Jacob was is Israel, right? Jacob was later renamed as Israel. And Jacob is the forefather progenitor of Israel, and he is the representative of Israel. So when Jacob was in Abraham's bosom, this was a sign that Israel is in Abraham's bosom. And, and Israel is... Uh, if those of Israel who are righteous, they will go, just like Jacob, they will be in Abraham's bosom. So that is the amazing significance of what Ju Jubilee says connected to the New Testament. I'm sure that that is what it means. There's no other explanation of this phrase, Abraham's bosom. And it's, it's too, again, it's too much of a, co a correspondence to be coincidence. They have to be connected because it's connecting the the bosom of Abraham with death. You know, if someone mentions someone's bosom, you don't normally associate that with death. But yet we have Jubilees and the Gospel of Luke, both associating it with death. So that can't be coincidence. Um, so yeah, that is that is uh, pretty much where I want to end today. Um, the One other thing I saw in verse 20, no, not 20, at verse 21 that I said that was interesting. You know how uh, Ham sinned against Noah and then Noah curses Canaan? Well, it's kind of confusing, right? Why does that happen? Well, we know in the scrolls that that happened because, um, because Noah had a dream and saw in advance that Canaan was going to sin because of Ham. Canaan was going to sin due to Ham's transgression. And this is confirmed in verse 21 of chapter 22 of Jubilees. Because it says, For owing to the transgression of Ham, Canaan erred. So that, that I thought was a very interesting verse. Because it tells us, Because Ham transgressed, that's why Canaan erred. And uh, so anyways, uh, that that's the uh, place I want to end today with with Abraham's death and, and specifically Abraham's bosom and the amazing connection that it has with the New Testament. Does anybody have any questions of anything I said briefly? Any anyone? If not, then we'll end it here. I have a little comment. Yeah. One, sure. of our, one of our people on uh, in the Yahad um, think tank has written um, Diaglot. Of Jubilees in Genesis. I'm, I've just wrote to him and I'm hoping to get an e-copy so we can follow along also in Genesis as well. Uh, shoot. Who's this? That what? Be, hold on a second, I'll tell you. Put a link up if you have it. When you get it. It's Russell Redden. Mm, I'm not no. sure I'm familiar with him. No. All right. It's He's, Diaglot of it's not called a dialogue. It's no, no, called no, it's Genesis just... and Jubilees compared. Right, right. It's got them side by side. Sweet. And it's, it's for sale. Ew. But yeah, well, $500. I'm, asking, I'm asking him for to see if he's got an e copy we can use. And he'll usually get back with me, but I thought I'd let you know. But you can find that on Amazon. If you what? put Jubilees and Genesis into the search engine, you'll uh -huh. Only thing I will say about that, that sounds like a good resource. The only downside is if he's using the Masoretic text yeah. as a comparison, that's an issue because Jubilees actually often agrees with Genesis according to the Septuagint and Genesis according to the Samaritan version. Um, but, but that it sounds like a great resource, though. I would be interested. Well, even if it, even if it wasn't that good translation-wise, at least it would give you comparison yeah. of one verse to verse insofar as you could. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, send, maybe put, maybe share it in the uh, group uh, if he's yeah. okay with that. Okay. Uh, I'm I have a question for you, Ernest.
Yeah. Um, the, the ideas you were talking about holiness earlier and, you know, eating with other people, how do you see um, the verses where it speaks about Paul, like uh, basically getting on to Peter about not eating with the uh, Gentiles? How do you see those verses playing out in the thought pattern you were expressing? Okay, so under the law, it was basically just Israel and and uh, Gentiles. That's it. Whereas after Yeshua came, it's not just that. It's not just Israel and the Gentiles. Now it's Israel, the church, and the Gentiles. And so um, from what I understand, Israel is still only to eat with Israel. The church is now only eat to eat with those in the church. So um, the problem was that some, some Israelites in the church, some Jews who were part of the, of the, the, of the new movement of Yeshua, they were baptized, and then they were not eating with other Gentiles who were also baptized into the church. And, and what we see specifically with the issue of, of Peter was apparently if we are to trust what Paul says, um, he was eating with Gentiles who were part of the covenant. He was eating with them, except when these other people came. Then he's like, oh, these people are here. I don't want them to think that I'm sinning. So when they came, when the other Jews came, he changed his behavior to try to please them and make them think that he wasn't being, being bad. Um, then when they went away, he started eating with them again. So he was being a hypocrite in that instance. So if he wasn't being hypocritical, I don't think he would have been, Paul would have been as harsh with him for how he was behaving. Uh, that's how I read it. And I, I think that, uh, I don't think that that contradicts the teaching of Peter and the Jubilees about um, not eating with those who are not part of the covenant. You know, Peter, Peter in the Nazarene Acts says for the baptized uh, not to eat with those who are unbaptized. Um, and that's something, I, I, we've talked about this um, at, in the Yahad group. I'm going to actually eventually be doing a study of the Nazarene Acts or the recognitions and homilies of Clement. It's going to be... of it do we follow it do we follow parts of it was peter right was he wrong um my take on it was peter is correct but that peter was then being a hypocrite and not eating with some people who were baptized into the faith so hopefully that answers the question we'll probably end it here because we could if there's more questions, you know, we probably could keep going, but I know it's getting late, and um, Jackson likes to keep it shorter, so. I know. Hey, uh, Unia, do you mind if I uh, message you on Facebook about a couple of questions? Not at all. Yeah, if anyone wants to message me, just message me, and uh, stay tuned. Uh, next week, we'll do Jubilees as well. Woohoo! Thank, thank you. Peace, thank brothers you and sisters. Thanks for coming. Shalom. It was great. Wow. Thank you all for coming. Let other people know, by the way, if you can, that they'll be interested in this. I know it's there's a limited interest in kind of a niche market for such things. Is it okay to share it outside yeah. of the odd? Yeah. Yeah, they're going to go up on podcasts and on YouTube. But the best thing you can do is offer other people a free gift, you know, like maybe a diamond ring or something. <laughs> no, I just meant to like my friends. I have a lot of friends but not all of them are yahadis i thought i was your only friend oh well you're my best friend all right <laughs> see you all next time love you Hello.